Okay, after the first foundation of civilization in the Near East that we have covered, historians break the ancient history of the Mediterranean region into two major periods. One is the rise of Greek civilization in the East. And the second is the emergence of Rome in the West. And most importantly, Rome's military conquest of the entire Mediterranean world. So thereafter came an impressive unification of East and West politically, economically, and socially. So in this class, we have followed the first of these periods through the merger of the Fertile Crescent by the Egyptians, and then into the Persian Empire, then the development of Greek civilization, and with the meteoric rise of Alexander the Great, we get the initiation of the Hellenistic Age. But it is not possible to focus just on the Hellenistic world without turning so we can see what was happening in the Western Mediterranean. By 200 BCE, Rome mastered the Mediterranean shores and was beginning to exert influence on the Greeks east of it. So to set the stage for Rome, we need to go back and appreciate the first stages of human development as the people of the peninsula are going to transition from the Paleolithic to the archaic traditions that made way for the foundation of surplus food production and specialization. So first, geography. The Italian peninsula is one of the three peninsulas of southern Europe. It spans over 600 miles from the Po Valley in the north to the central Mediterranean Sea in the south. The peninsula is well known for its boot shape. The peninsula is bordered by the Tyrrhenian Sea on the west, the Ionian Sea on the south, and the Adriatic Sea on the east. And then to the far north, you will notice the Alpine Mountains, or the Alps. And that provides a natural barrier to the interior part. And the interior part consists of mountains, plains, and coasts that are lined with cliffs. And despite the cooler climate in the mountains, the peninsula experiences very mild and damp temperatures, which provides nutrient-rich soil suitable for agricultural pursuits. So by about 800 BCE, Middle East civilizations, the Aramaeans by land and the Phoenicians by sea, were trading on a wider scale than had ever been before possible. And with the Assyrian Empire bringing political unity to an increasing interconnected marketing system, this led to a wave of colonization schemes westward, with the Phoenicians taking the lead. <clears throat> the peoples of the Western Mediterranean, meanwhile, were in subsistence agricultural practices where they emphasized a nature ethics based on their environmental religions. And around 1000 BCE, groups identified as the Latium and Oscan created settlements. Social and economic distinctions existed on a very rudimentary level. Miners and smiths worked iron and copper. Potters made vessels decorated with geometric designs, and an upper class of warrior overlords was common. Roman history and myth have it that twin brothers Romulus and Remus founded the city of Rome. The story itself has Greek as well as Roman elements, and it is agreed by scholars that the oral tradition originated in the 4th century BCE, being accepted as part of custom at the end of the 3rd century BCE. The Greeks typically created mythical heroes to explain the origins of place names, with the Romans including Mars in the story or in the legend to provide connection to the story. So at your leisure, you should search for meaning of the legend so as to find out how the orphaned twins were suckled by a she-wolf that took in the abandoned infants. By 800 BCE, the Italic peoples excuse me, began to specialize as subsistence farming gave way to surplus production. The alphabetic script made possible the emergence of literature and the codification of religious ritual and legal views. The Italic peoples borrowed the Greek practice of erecting temples and carving statues, 
making concrete earlier worship of environmental spirits. Historians point to three peoples transmitting Eastern achievements westward that may have influenced the rise of city-states in Italy. These were the Greeks, the Phoenicians, and the Etruscans. The Phoenicians seem to be the least significant for historians, partly because their settlements were trading posts except for the main districts surrounding Carthage. Carthage came to acquire general control over the Mediterranean where they centralized power, and this centralization of power was due to Greek pressure, which created tensions between the two. The Greek colonization of the West started early with Mycenaean traders, but it was not until 750 BCE that a colony was firmly established at Cumae in the far north of the peninsula. And thereafter, a host of Greek colonies sprang up on the southern coast in Sicily and eventually in Gaul, or is known as France today, in the north. Agricultural settlements of Greeks who were dissatisfied in their homeland. Now the third people to come from the east were the Etruscans, and they provide historians the most fascinating and puzzling elements in ancient history. Greek historian Dionysius considered the Etruscans of native Italian origin, while Herodotus recounted a tale of their movements from the Aegean in a time of famine. Either way, the Etruscans seem to have made their way west as peoples from Asia Minor and settled in the uplands known as Etruria by about 800 BCE. They organized themselves in advanced political form of the city-state. They built a number of cities on hilltops from which they ruled. Now, the expansion of Greeks, Phoenicians, and Etruscans from the eastern Mediterranean and the western shores was possible due to the sufficient superiority in military techniques and social organization, creating trading posts and settler colonies wherever they wished along the new coasts. Now, at first, they respected each other's zones of influence, with Greek merchants trading with both Phoenicians at Carthage and up in Etruria. But by the 6th century, troubles emerged over territorial possessions. The Greeks were the element that brought on wars by reason of their unceasing expansion. And for 60 years, the Greeks menaced Etruscan shores and they menaced trade from Carthage to Etruria. Etruscans and Carthaginians joined forces and fought great naval battles against the Greeks. But the Greeks won. However, the Greeks' forces were decimated. Weakened, the Carthaginians launched attacks, but the Persian invasion preoccupied the Greeks, leaving Sicily split between the Greeks and the Carthaginians. The Greeks and Carthaginians would fight over Sicily for two centuries until eventually the Romans will conquer both. But meanwhile, Greek expansion in Italy was halted by Etruscan opposition and by the bitter divisions amongst the Greek city-states themselves. So we have a lot of complications here. But nonetheless, it was the native peoples that will remember these invasions from the outsiders. And as the three powers expanded their energies in conflicts, a way was opened for the rise of a local power which was to be Rome. And they stood to conquer the three by reason of their division. With Carthage maintaining its base in Sicily and Spain against the Greeks, it led to an enduring tension which helped eventually to invite Rome's expansion outside Italy proper. In Italy proper, the predominant cultural influence was to remain Greek. While Rome developed political and social institutions helping its expansive qualities, culturally it was heavily indebted to Greece. Culture that is identifiably Etruscan developed in Italy around 800 BCE. In tradition, Rome was founded as a city-state in 753 BCE. Now, when the Etruscans gained control of the city by a wealthy family known as the Tarkins, Romans were harshly ruled by Tarkin kins, kings, especially Tarkin the Proud, 
and his reign was characterized by bloodshed and violence. The Etruscans established a confederation of independent city-states that the Romans would later help form into what would be known as the Latin League, from which they would develop their first conquests and allies. The Etruscans were skilled metal workers and architects who mastered the vault and the dome, both of which Rome would adopt. Etruscan women enjoyed a relatively more liberated position than did Greek women, and Rome adopted this attitude by allowing women to be more active outside the home and even engage to an extent in politics. Gladiatorial sports were taken from Etruscan society, as was the practice of divination. The Roman practice of centering urban life around stone temples was borrowed from the Etruscans, as was the foundation myth of Romulus and Remus. In 510 BCE, an uprising against Tarquin the Proud led to the expulsion of most of the royal family. In exile, Tarquin attempted to regain the throne, but was rebuffed. And with his death in 496, the time of kings ended. The Roman people, under the leadership of Brutus, would no longer trust sole power in one ruler. Alliances of Latin towns drove the Etruscans out, and a republic was formed. Rome's Republican era began with the overthrow of the Etruscan monarchy by Lucius Junius Brutus in 509 BCE. Through a series of bitter wars, Rome was able to conquer all of Italy, especially after the Celts or Gauls sacked Rome in 390 BCE. Through mutual understandings, the Republic of Rome was ruled by the Senate and its assemblies. It was governed by an unwritten, complex constitution centering on the principles of a separation of powers and accompanied by checks and balances. The constitution was not formal, it was not official, it was unwritten, it was uncodified, and it was constantly evolving. While the Republic reflected the ideal of shared governance, it was heavily influenced by the struggle between the aristocracy and other prominent Romans who were not part of the nobility. Nonetheless, it was a shared government rather than power concentrated in a monarchy. In politics, Romans maintained citizenship. Allies were granted citizenship, but they did not have the franchise or the rights to vote in key matters. Allies were subject to taxes and military service. So it was the Senatus Populusque Romanus that derived its power from the consent of the aristocracy, which was usually locked in struggle with the common people. At first, the government was organized into two branches, and that was the office of the council that took care of government functions and operations, executing laws. Then there was the Senate and the Assembly of Centuries, who created laws to govern the Republic. 300 members of the Senate were men elected who served for life. The Assembly of Centuries was made up of 100 men who were elected on a regular basis. The Senate was dominated by the patricians. The patricians were the wealthy aristocratic class. The plebeians, or the commoners, resented their lack of political power and they continuously struggled in class conflict with the aristocracy. Eventually, through threats of strikes from service in the armed forces, the plebeians gained a measure of political rights, gaining concessions from the patricians through the creation of what became known as the Office of Tribune. It held veto power over any law passed by the Senate. Now, most often, the focus of the Roman Senate was directed towards foreign policy yet it also managed the civil administration in the city and the town. The office of the consul consisted of the highest ranking magistrates. They held supreme power in both civil and military matters. They would preside over the Senate and the assemblies. In Rome, they headed the government, while abroad they commanded an army. The legislative assemblies technically represented the people of Rome. Citizens were organized on the basis of centuries and tribes who gathered into their own assemblies. And assemblies had the final say in the election of magistrates 
and the enactment of laws. So the textbook provides you uh, numerous opportunities by which to appreciate the role of consuls, censors, and tribunes. Now let's take a look at Roman law. The Republic created a law code where 12 bronze tablets engraved with Roman law were placed strategically throughout the peninsula. And in 451 BCE, the law code began with what were known as the 12 tables. The position of praetor was created to implement the law code fairly and judiciously. The praetor was the judge who acted as a moderator. Now generally, three types of laws were created. Civil laws, these were codes to govern the citizens of the Roman Republic. Then there was the laws of the Gentiles, codes to govern the non-citizens of the Republic. And then there were the natural laws, codes to govern all humans. Romans insisted on respect for law and justice for citizens. It was through the assembly of the centuries, through the assembly of the tribes, and through the plebeian council, the magistrates were vested with constitutional powers to enforce a state of laws. No one was above the law. And while the consuls were the highest ranking magistrates, praetors administered civil law and commanded provincial armies. And every five years, two censors, elected for 18-month term, conducted a census, enrolled citizens in the Senate, and then purged them from the Senate. Aediles were officers elected to conduct domestic affairs in Rome, managing public games and shows, and then quaestors assisted consuls in Rome and governors in the province in the collection of taxes. The tribunes were the embodiment of the plebeians. It was considered a capital offense to harm a tribune, disregard his veto, or interfere with his term of office. And this came about due to a social conflict that was identified as the struggle of the orders. The struggle occurred when the plebeians staged a walkout and general strike, forcing the patricians to grant concessions. And the resolutions of what is known as the Concilium Plebis, the assembly of the people, became the force of law for all classes of citizens. Now, regarding respect for Roman tradition and having roots in religion, the office of Pontifex Maximus granted prestige to the person appointed as high priest. Now, it was the most important position in ancient Roman religion and it was open only to patricians until 264 BC when a plebeian will be the first to occupy the post. Now, it was a distinctly religious office in the Republic, but it was charged with both religious and political authority. The office was charged with observing rituals associated with the various deities of the Roman pantheon. Romans honored different spirits they believed were found in nature, and the office of Pontifex Maximus was in charge of the prayers and sacrifices for the entire Republic. It was every Roman citizen's duty to perform the rituals to ensure peace and tranquility of the Republic. Now, as presented earlier, the Greeks and the Carthaginians would fight over Sicily for two centuries. And with Carthage maintaining its base in Sicily and Spain against the Greeks, it led to an enduring tension which helped eventually to invite Rome's expansion outside Italy proper. After a diplomatic dispute between Rome and a Greek colony erupted in, into open fire in a naval confrontation, a Greek army of some 25,000 men stationed themselves in Italian soil in 280 BCE. The Roman army matched the Greeks in what is known as the Battle of Beneventum. And though indecisive, it led to the Greeks, the Greeks withdrawing, and this impressed on the Romans thinking that they were capable of defending themselves against a dominant military power. So both the Romans and the Carthaginians had considerable territory and interest in the island of Sicily, 
when settlements on Sicily began to appeal to the two powers in order to resolve internal conflicts, the First Punic War began. In 264 BCE, land battles erupted in Sicily early on. And when the theater shifted to naval battles, the Romans had no navy to speak of. Carthage, a great naval power, held the advantage, and it forced Rome to quickly build a fleet and train soldiers. And after training and the invention of a grappling engine, a Roman naval force is going to defeat the Carthaginian fleet, and after several victories, the Carthaginians are going to sue for peace. The Romans exacted a huge indemnity for the inconvenience of war. A continuing distrust led to the renewal of hostilities in the Second Punic War, when Hannibal Barca attacked a Spanish town which had diplomatic ties to Rome. Hannibal then crossed the Italian Alps to invade Italy. Once on the peninsula, Hannibal defeated several Roman armies and laid siege to the Italian countryside. 70,000 Romans were killed in the Battle of Cannae. Now, unable to defeat Hannibal on Italian soil, the Roman general Scipio formulated a plan to threaten the Carthaginian capital. And Hannibal was recalled to Africa, and when he did so, he was defeated by Scipio at the Battle of Zama. Carthage sued for peace. Rome's military discipline and organization created the opportunity for control of the peninsula and expansion beyond it. What was known as a manipular army formation of around 5,000 men of both heavy and light infantry, known as legions, was based on social class, age, and military experience. Manipoles were units of 120 men, each drawn from a single infantry class. In battle, there were three discrete lines based on the heavy infantry types. The first line wore brass breastplates and helmets, each soldier carrying an ironclad shield and armed with a sword and two throwing spears. The second line followed with a lighter coat rather than a solid brass plate, breastplate. And the third line was, was the remnant of the Greek hoplite style carrying a lighter spear. The three lines were based on age and experience with unproven soldiers in the first line, older men with experience in the second line, and the veterans of advanced age and experience in the third line. A number of light infantry and cavalry troops supported the manipular legion. And it was with these tactics that legions decimated other armies in the battlefield. So when Hannibal was in Italy, Rome is going to discover an agreement between Philip V of the Kingdom of Macedon and Hannibal, where they were to form an alliance and become common enemies of Rome. So the First Macedon War was, saw the Romans involved in limited land operations, and the idea was to prevent Philip from aiding Hannibal. It worked. After Hannibal's surrender, and then for 45 years, from 214 to 169 BCE, Rome engaged in three more Macedonian wars. In the Second Macedonian War, Philip was defeated and Macedonia was forced to surrender. The Romans then went after Greek kingdoms of the Seleucid Empire, defeating them in the Battle of Thermopylae, forcing an evacuation. Philip's son, Perseus, renewed interest in taking over Greece, and Rome declared war on Macedonia for the third time. And the fourth and final Macedonian war was fought from 150 to 148 BCE, where the Romans swiftly eliminated the Macedonians and two years later destroyed Corinth, which led to the surrender and conquest of Greece. So historians emphasize that the conquest of Greece impacted Rome society tremendously. This subjugation gave the Romans hundreds of thousands of slaves, and the inclusion of these slaves had a very profound effect on Roman life. Greek cooks 
imported new styles of cooking and flavors to the Roman table. Greek tutors for children taught Greek religion and philosophy, the influential of which were Epicureanism and Stoicism. And of course, Stoicism emphasized duty, which had been a Roman value, but it was now and became a system of thought. And the emphasis on Stoicism on public service likewise shaped Roman political values. Bilingualism became common, and Greek literature became a standard against which Roman writers measured themselves. Greek styles, notably the epic, were extremely popular, and Roman literature failed to grow beyond the Greek styles for centuries. The literature and theater became pastimes of the wealthy, and the Greek creature comforts of the East were soon adopted by the Romans. So Rome was being transformed from a republic of farmers into a new society with vast gaps between the haves and the have-nots. New habits, especially the Hellenistic aspects of society. So after the Romans took over Greece, they immediately followed up with the Third Punic War, which in reality, they didn't like the Carthaginians, and so they committed genocide. Carthage was completely destroyed, was burnt to the ground. The soil was sowed with salt to prevent growth of plant life. And those that were left alive, the men, the women, and the children, were sold into slavery. And all of North Africa and the Spanish territories were taken over by Rome. So historians ponder how the Punic Wars turned Rome from a republic into an empire. The Punic Wars forced Rome to play a part in international rather than just Italian affairs. The wars resulted in new alliance with Italians and other Europeans, and it geared the economy for war. 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 The wars were fought not only in Sicily, but also throughout Europe, especially in Spain, and in France or Gaul with the advances of Hannibal in the Second Punic War. And it gave Rome some power in these areas. Rome's interest in Africa increased as it attempted to neutralize possible allies and manpower resources of the Carthaginian Empire. And the Senate <clears throat> granted powers to the generals, specifically Scipio, to act without their approval and increase the size of Rome's military exponentially. And with the defeat of Carthage, Rome held all the former lands, cultures, and peoples of the Carthaginian Empire, and Rome became a geographic empire. So the organization and the bureaucracy, just to control the newly acquired lands, helped to transform Rome into a political empire. The overseas provinces of Spain, North Africa, and Sicily brought Rome tremendous wealth in grain, in silver mines. It sparked a policy of westward expansion that proved to be a very formative influence on Rome and Europe. So Rome's expansion and commitments abroad brought it into conflict with other Mediterranean powers, and this paved the way for future conquests and growth. So now you are ready to watch a documentary that concludes this part of the presentation on Rome. Okay? So go and enjoy the documentary and have fun after part one of Rome. Thank you.